Hey, yo, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 575 of the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast. For members of the public, today's episode is just a short one. We're going to talk about some basic information about southern mulloway or dewfish, a little bit about their biology, their ecology, stuff that can help you to understand how they behave, why they behave the way they do, and that will obviously help you to catch fish in the long term. For Team Doc Lures members, today's episode is a lot more because we've added a 40-minute roundup of all of the Jewfish podcast episodes, over 30 of them, that we've conducted since the start of the Australian Lure Fishing podcast. And as you might expect, there's a whole bunch of things that have come out of those conversations that are common to all of those fishermen. So I'm sharing that information, but I'm also picking some really key stuff some really specific tips and hints and hacks and that sort of thing for our Team Doc Lewis members out of those 30 episodes and sharing those as well and relating them back to this biological and ecological information that I'm about to share with everybody. Before we start, I grew up in South Australia where this species, in most parts at least, is referred to as Mulloway. But since moving to the East Coast many, many years ago, I got converted and started calling them by their other name, the Jewfish. And I'm kind of in the habit of calling them that now. So I'm going to continue to call them Jewfish throughout this episode. But just be aware that Jewfish and Southern Mulloway are the same species. Uh, Gyrosomus japonicus. They're also sometimes called river kingfish, soapies, dewies. In parts of South Australia, they're sometimes called butterfish. They're sometimes called croaker. In Japan, they're called mega. In South Africa, they're called cob. You know, they're found right around Southern Australia. They're found in India, Pakistan, Africa, China, Japan, right? And so they've got different names, but we're talking about the species Gyrosomus japonicus. So the dewfish or the dewy is basically found around about the Bundaberg area in central Queensland, right around the southern parts of Australia, all the way to well, the Gask area, maybe up as far as Exmouth on the Western Australian coastline. And at its northern extremity in both Queensland and in Western Australia, it kind of overlaps with the northern dewfish or the black dew. So the black dew basically is found from around about Shark Bay or maybe a little bit north all the way around the top end of Australia to around about Bundaberg. So there's a little bit of overlap between the two species. And it's probably important to point that out because they do have different bag limits and different size limits for those who are wanting to keep fish. And in Queensland, the black dew fishery currently gets closed when a commercial and recreational combined quota gets exceeded. So you need to know which species you're catching if you're in those areas where there might be some overlap. So the key distinction between the black dew and the southern mulloway is the shape of the tail. So the southern mulloway has a squared off tail. If you look at it, it's kind of a, a triangle from the tail wrist. The, the end of the tail is quite square. With the black dew, the middle part of the tail protrudes a little bit, a little bit like a barramundi. So it's kind of a diamond-shaped tail. There's a couple other things as well. The black dew is a little bit thinner around the tail wrist, that narrowest part where the body joins the tail. And it's also a little bit darker in colour. But the most reliable way to tell them apart is the shape of that tail. So if it's got a diamond-shaped tail, if the middle of the tail sticks out a bit, then it's definitely a black dew. And on the east coast of Australia, between about southeast Queensland and Port Hacking, there's also another species called the trag dew. And this is a much smaller fish. And the juveniles are often found in kind of deep bays and inlets and estuaries. But the adult fish tend to be out on offshore reefs, often in reasonably deep water. And those guys are easy to separate. You're not so likely, I guess, to catch one of those and confuse it with a dew. But if you do, then they can be distinguished by kind of a lunate tail. In other words, the tail's a bit concave. But also they've got a bit of yellow around the mouth. And as I said, they're found in kind of different habitats as well than what the what the dewfish are. So for the scientists amongst us, those three species are all part of the family cyanidae and they're kind of the croakers. And there's a few other species around as well. But again, smaller fish, less likely to be confused with the southern Mulloway. Now a little bit of trivia for you. Mulloway is the Aboriginal word for the great one. So while lure fishers refer to them as silver ghosts or the ghosts of the estuaries, the traditional owners tended to refer to them as the great one. And the name dewfish or dewy actually came from the fact that this fish has quite large ear bones or otoliths. And so people used to collect the otoliths as a kind of trophy of their captures. And so it was the dual fish. The otolith was used in jewellery and it has since been abbreviated and shortened to dewfish and now often to dewy. So there you go. There's a potted summary 
of the classification and nomenclature around southern Mulloway. Now, there's some interesting stuff to share about the biology and the ecology of this species. It's a fairly mobile species, so juveniles and smaller fish, you know, down to around, well, from 15 centimetres and downwards, I guess, tend to reside mainly in estuaries and inter areas, and they tend to feed largely on shrimp and small crustaceans, right? But as they mature, they start to feed increasingly on small fish, and eventually one of their favourite foods becomes squid, but certainly bait fish and squid, they continue to eat prawns, and those fish that continue to live in the surf zone, often even to you know, large mature sizes, will continue to eat beach worms as well. Now, I should mention that in terms of their life history and their spawning habits and all that kind of stuff, there's kind of, I, I guess there's a few little debates and arguments that go on in Dewey circles, and you'll see these in the scientific literature. And I think some of that stems from the fact that we probably don't know, like most of our fish species, don't know enough about them. There hasn't been enough study done it's been some really good work done, PhD students, all sorts of things, but you know, we still really know comparatively little, I guess, about dewfish. So, for example, the common convention or the common wisdom has been that dewfish tend to spawn in the surf zones and that the eggs and the larvae of the dewfish tend to be floating, they tend to be pelagic, and that the juvenile fish hatch or that the eggs hatch and the juvenile fish grow out in the surf zone and then move into the estuary is at around about 25 or 30 centimetres in length. And then there are other peer-reviewed papers in the scientific literature that talk about dewfish spawning in estuaries and the juveniles growing out in estuaries. So a couple of different and sometimes conflicting pictures of the dewfish's life history there. And some of that, as I said, is that we may not have as, as good an understanding of this fish as we'd like. And some of it is that probably different populations of this species do things differently. So we know that with lots of species, they, they spawn at different times in Eastern Australia than they do in Western Australia and that kind of stuff. There's probably variations with local populations of this fish that help to confuse things and get scientists arguing with each other when, in fact, both parties could potentially be right. Something we can say with confidence, though, is that the sub-adult and adult fish tend to move a fair bit. They tend to move along surf zones. They tend to inhabit rocky headland areas. They tend to inhabit coastal reefs out to depths of at least 100 metres, if not more. And particularly some of the really big mature fish tend to become quite solitary and inhabit those deeper reefs, and some of the smaller fish tend to school up. So you hear the term school dew, which refers to fish maybe in that sort of 60 to 110 centimetre kind of size, maybe a little bit less than that. And then the big mature fish, those 140, 150, 160 centimetre fish, they tend to be a little bit more solitary. Here's another example of that sort of conflicting information. So there's definitely evidence in Western Australia of dewfish spawning in the Swan and Canning River systems. But if you look at the South Australian coastline, and particularly the Great Australian Bight, and Southern Western Australia as well for that matter, that's an area where it doesn't get a lot of fishing pressure because it's pretty remote, but there's some massive, massive dewfish, 50, 60 kilo fish have been taken by anglers off the beaches in that part of the world. There's no estuaries within a very long way. So either those fish have migrated a long way from estuaries in Western Australia or South Australia, or they've spawned, as other theories suggest, in the surf zone and the larvae have been pelagic. But then again, those larvae would not have had estuaries to have moved into. So lots of stuff we don't know, lots of conflicting information, pieces of the puzzle that still need to be put together. Now something we do know about dewfish is that they're part of the croaker family and they're so called because they have the ability to make a croaking noise, which they do with their swim bladder. I'm not going to go into exactly how they do that. But it's actually a very useful tool for scientists because that croaking noise is quite distinct from other fish species or any sounds that other fish species can make. It's quite distinct from noises that might be made by kind of man-made items, I guess, or maritime activities or anything like that. And there's been quite a bit of work done, particularly in Western Australia, on recording those sounds and using them to identify and locate spawning areas or spawning aggregations of dewfish. So that's kind of cool and quirky and interesting all at the same time, I guess. One of the things I find very interesting about dewfish is their adaptation for vision. So dewfish have what's called a tapetum lucidum, and it's a common adaptation in the eyes of terrestrial vertebrates and nocturnal terrestrial vertebrates in particular, but it seems to be a little bit less common in fish. So it's kind of interesting that dewfish have this tapetum lucidum in their eye. And 
what the tapetum lucidum is is a reflective organ at the back of the eye that kind of concentrates the light and mirrors it back so that they can see better in dim light. They can see shapes and silhouettes and that kind of thing in low light conditions. And I guess the presence of a tapetum lucidum kind of corresponds or kind of correlates with the theory that Jewfish tend to be nocturnal feeders, which a lot of people believe. But what's interesting is that some hatchery studies of Jewfish in New South Wales have found that the larval and juvenile Jewfish actually tend to feed better during the day. And those studies are pointed to them being very much a visual feeder, certainly at that stage of their life cycle anyway, more so than a, a species that relies on sense of smell or vibration or movement or electromagnetism or anything like that to detect their prey. So vision is very important to juvenile and larval dewfish and feeding during the day allows them to use their vision a lot better. So that's kind of at odds with the common theory that dewfish tend to be nocturnal animals. Certainly adult dewfish that we're targeting with lures tend to be a nocturnal animal. Now it's possible of course that they start out being visual feeders and then they turn to being nocturnal animals and you know, they go from feeding better in daylight to feeding better after dark. That's possible. But one of the things that I've noticed talking to ALF podcast guests who are consistently catching quality dewfish on lures is that the majority of them, certainly in our estuaries at least, are fishing during the daylight hours and they're finding they're catching more fish on lures during the day than what a lot of people can catch on bait at night, which again points to dewfish not necessarily being nocturnal feeders, not to say they don't feed at night, but not being as nocturnal as we might have thought. So I've got a theory to offer on this. I'm going to give it right now. So adult dewfish seem to prefer to hunt in areas where there's strong turbulence or strong currents, such as the, the surf zone or really strongly tidal estuaries. And they seem to come into very shallow water during the hours of darkness, and they like to sit in salt water beneath the muddy fresh water around the ends of sea waters during floods. So three examples of where adult dewfish tend to hunt and feed. Now all of these situations are where the visibility and the light penetration are low and where the tapetum lucidum is going to be beneficial to them in being able to see prey, but also giving them that advantage that the prey can't see them. Now obviously the tapetum lucidum also helps them at night, but I just theorise that because they do seem to feed so well during the day that it's actually not so much about Nighttime, it's actually more about water clarity, uh, turbidity, sand being mixed up, milkiness from you know, air being entrained by turbulent water and all that kind of stuff. Now here's the other side of that thought process as well, is that fish don't have eyelids. They can't close their eyes. They also don't have pupils that can be constricted. So in a human being, if you shine a bright light in our eyes, we're either going to close our eyes or the pupil's going to, going to constrict, or both, right? Because bright light shone into your eyes with the pupils wide open hurts. It's actually painful, right? Now, fish don't have the ability to constrict their pupils. They don't have the ability to close their eyes. And dewfish have this tapetum lucidum that is concentrating the light and making it even brighter for them. So I suspect that in clear water conditions, that concentration of light might increase the pain that the fish feels they can't blink and they can't manage that light. And the only way, in fact, that a dewfish can reduce the pain and reduce the amount of light that's hitting its eye is to head for deeper water or find somewhere shadowy that they can sit. So there's my theory, and you can take it or you can leave it, but I believe that tapetum lucidum isn't about them being nocturnal. It's about being able to hunt in other low-light conditions. Now, something else that's really important for us as sport fishers to understand is that dewfish tend to be quite sensitive to being mishandled. So they have a fairly poor survival rate unless they're handled properly. So remember to never lift a, a dewfish or any fish really by the jaw, especially larger fish. Always support the weight underneath the belly. If you're going to remove them from the water, make sure that you're prepared before you remove them from the, from the water to take your photographs. So have your camera set up, have everything ready to go before you actually lift that fish out of the water. Take a quick snap keep the time out of the water to a minimum and release some quick smart if possible if you don't need a photograph then don't remove the fish from the water at all that is the best way to protect them from being damaged and remember what i said to you that they are in great pain when you pull them out of the water because 
they cannot close their eyes and they cannot constrict their pupils. So they're getting eye pain, they're getting breathing pain, they're under a fair bit of stress. The amount of time that they're out of the water makes a huge difference to their survival rate. So if you really want them to survive, you need to get them back into the water quickly or not take them out of the water at all. The other thing to be aware of is that they are prone to barotrauma. So any fish that's been taken from water of a depth of 10 metres or more, I would recommend that you use a release weight to release them. And there's been studies that have shown that fish that get released with barot appear to be okay for a day or two and then they go belly up sometime later. So really important, release them with a release weight. If you don't have a release weight, you might need to vent the fish. If you don't know how to do that properly, go and Google it. Very important to get it right. But you're going to give them a much better chance of surviving if you handle them properly, use a release weight, and, uh, and get them back into the water really quickly. Okay, so in just a moment, we're going to say goodbye to our public listeners and the Team Doc Lures guys and myself are going to go through a whole bunch of information that's come from 30-odd podcast interviews and tie it into this stuff that we've been talking about, help to flesh out some of the key information you need to understand if targeting Jewfish on lures is what you want to do. So there's about 40 minutes of discussion there for Team Doc Lures members to go through. Uh, members of the public, if you're not part of Team Doc Lures and you would like to access that, and all the other great resources that are part of Team Doc Lures, then you need to consider supporting the Australian Lure Fishing Podcast. But the other great resource that you really need to get your hands on is that we've put together a Jewfish Tackle Cheat Sheet. So you'll find that over at doclures.com. It gives you a list of the brands, the sizes, the styles, everything you need to know about lures for Jewfish. So that's all over at doclures.com. All right, so five things that um, if you're not a Team Doc Lures member, you might want to do a bit of research on that we're going to talk about in just a moment. If you are a Team Doc Lures member, the first one is fish where the bait is. So a lot of our guests have talked about structure, they've talked about tides, they've talked about conditions, but they've all come back to where is the bait, uh, that bait being tailor, mullet, salmon, trevally, estuary perch, brim, ludic, you name it, a whole bunch of different species. But where there's bait, if you've got the right bait, you've got the right conditions, whether it's that sort of swirly pothole sort of stuff off a headland, whether it's the foamy, dirty water off a seawall, whether it's uh, you know the deep water around a bridge, whether it's those shallow flats, places that we talked about in the estuaries. Um, if there's bait, then there's a good chance there'll be fish. The other one is we talk about how to target active fish, find active fish, and how they respond to your lure and your presentation versus those fish are a little bit less active that may be in a resting phase, both are catchable, um, both are valid targets and different guests have approached these in different ways, so we talk about that. We get right into the weeds about tides and the best tides to fish for dewfish where, you know, in, in different scenarios, okay? So whether it's off the rock walls, whether it's you know, in an estuary, whether it's in a tidal lake, you know, different, different tides and different tide phases to fish. We get into some strategies for targeting fish around structure and in deep water with currents. And then finally, I go through some key things that have been suggested and have been tested and have been recommended by ALF podcast guests who are gun dewy fishers about some different strategies and techniques that they use that you may not have thought of before. So tons of great stuff there. There's 40 minutes of great information there to be shared. If you are part of Team Doc Lures, we're going there right now 